Parliament, which was protected by barricades, people shouted, you do not represent us. Demonstrators gathered in front of the ruling Popular Party headquarters to protest. They then went to the Socialist Party's headquarters, which they also blamed for Spain's financial crisis. But protesters then clashed with riot police who fired rubber bullets and arrested at least three people. People are very angry and some people get violent. The riot police are the first to do so. People are really fed up and angry. It's not like it was a year ago when we took to the streets peacefully. Now there are many other things. Yesterday, for example, people were directly insulted in Congress. Since Wednesday, people have been out on the streets. The unemployed, civil servants, professionals in the tourism industry. They have all been hit hard by the new 65 billion euro austerity package. The new measures include cuts in public spending, tax increases, and there will be no more Christmas bonuses for civil servants. They've made the largest budget cuts in history. I'm a state worker, but it also affects the unemployed. It affects everyone who has to pay taxes, which have been increased. It's outrageous that the workers have to pay the bank's excesses. Protesters are calling for the government to resign. They refuse the deficit-cutting measures imposed by the European Union and the International Monetary Fund. Meanwhile, in Greece, trade unions have called for a day of protest next Thursday. Over to the Middle East, the bloodshed in Syria is mounting by the day with new reports of massacres in a village called Tramsha. Syrian activists say at least 200 people were killed in execution-style killings in the village. Meanwhile, U.S. intelligence reports indicate some worrying details of movement of Syrian chemical weapon stockpiles to new sites. Experts are worried as it might resort to using the huge stockpiles of mustard and sarin gas in a grandstand to mount in pressure against his rule. CNN's Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr tells us more. About how far Bashar al-Assad will go to keep his grip on power. The U.S. now believes the Syrian regime has moved some of its chemical weapons in recent days. As the fighting continues, U.S. officials will only say the weapons are still under the control of Assad's forces. But a former CIA director says, make no mistake, the U.S. is urgently trying to gather all the intelligence it can. I would see that ratcheting up because you just want to know. Look, at the end of the day, if something untoward's happening, you want to have as much time as possible to assess what it is and be able to develop a response. The Pentagon won't comment on the story first reported by the Wall Street Journal, but said any use of chemical weapons by Syria would be a red line for the international community. It's Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has already warned Damascus. Given their behavior and the chemical weapons they possess, it is imperative that they understand their international responsibilities. The U.S. military estimates there are nearly 50 chemical weapon sites throughout the country, deadly mustard gas and sarin among the holdings. With violence even spreading to Damascus, officials suggest Assad could have taken the risk of moving the weapons to put them in a safer place. But another theory? Assad knows U.S. satellites watch those sites and his communications are intercepted. Is he just taunting the West to show he can freely move his deadly weapons around? I'm far more concerned about loss of control over the weapons and, and what happens when the chaos that seems to be infecting the larger society might touch upon some of these weapon stockpiles. But would the Syrian leader really use the weapons? In 1988 in Iraq, Saddam Hussein did. Thousands of Kurds died in a chemical weapons attack. But that led to years of doubts about whether Iraq maintained a stockpile. This time, it's different. I mean, they're there. This is, it's not like Iraq where you have to guess at it. Okay, we know where they are. If Assad were to use those chemical weapons, the U.S. believes that also would be a red line for Russia and China, that they would withdraw their support for the Syrian regime, and it could open the door to military intervention. Barbara Starr, CNN, the Pentagon. Well, from that, we'll take another break. The news continues right after. <laughs> Sulimia, the continent, 
The collection and selection for our Gammon Top 10 Music Video Countdown is on. The Top 10 Music Video Countdown is a segment of The Gammon Show. Submit your music videos today and get a chance to win one free music video for the song of your choice. I mean completely free. Details for entry and participation soon on GRTS. Well, over to sports, China has a new superstar football player and the crowds in the world's most populous nation are getting wild. Didier Drogba, the Ivory Coast striker formerly of Chelsea, arrived in Shanghai Saturday with a new contract worth worth $300,000 a week. When the jubilant teams in Shanghai finally calmed down, Drogba talked about why he made the move and singing and Stan Grant was there. Well, this is the biggest news that Chinese soccer has ever had. The man you can see here speaking behind me on the stage, Didier Drogba, is the single biggest name that's ever been attracted here to Chinese football. He's now going to play for Shanghai Shenhua. He's come here fresh from victory in the UEFA Champions League with Chelsea, where he scored the winning goal. But this man, is, of course, is used to success. He's won three Premier League titles. He's also won four FA Cup crowns. But beyond his role here, in football he's also someone who's been recognized for his achievements in, in uh, developing african education and health through his various charities in fact drogba has been named by time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people on earth but why is he coming here to china he says it's all about the challenge i know china is a, is a great uh, sports country so for me it was also a big challenge because it could have been easy for me to stay in Europe and go to another team, another big team. But uh, I want to achieve this challenge, so that's why I decided to come here. So much speculation, of course, has revolved around just what he is being paid. We know that footballers get astronomical salaries. Now, the rumour is that he's earning about 300000 that's right, 300000 US dollars a week. And this is what he had to say to that. The money is not really what is the most important thing, because everybody knows that uh, uh, I give a lot of my money to, to my foundation, my, all my sponsors deal, most of them I give them to my foundation, so really I didn't come here uh, with the idea of, of making a lot of money. Drogba joins a former Chelsea colleague, Nicholas Anelka, who's already playing here in Shanghai. This is seen as yet another step in opening China up to the world of sport, being able to attract the big names to come and play here in sports like basketball and now, of course, also in football. As far as Drogba is concerned, his job here is to win titles, something he knows all about. Stan Grant, CNN, Shanghai. $300,000 a week for Didier Drogba. Well, before we go, a reminder of our top stories, government and its development partners have concluded a two-day conference on the program for Accelerated Growth and Employment page. Over a thousand households have received food items courtesy of United Arab Emirates charitable agency based in the Gambia. Prominent Malian journalist Sauti Haidara has been kidnapped and bitten by assailants believed to be Malian government soldiers. And U.S. intelligence have reported the movement of chemical stockpiles to strategic areas in Syria amid increasing fears over the mountain bloodshed in the country. Well, you can also follow that story and all the GRTS programs live on our website, which is at www.grts.gm. There you can also monitor GRTS radio live. Well, that's all in this edition of the news. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of the day.